All right. Hello, beautiful humans. Thank you for joining Teach Gen Tech. Today we have Laura here. And Laura, please introduce yourself and what you'll be teaching us today. Hi, Jen, and hello, everybody. I am Laura. I am a technical writer um, at Suborbital Software Systems. But before I was a technical writer, I thought I was going to be a data scientist. And so I was studying Python and data science. Um, and before that, I was a uh, math professor. Actually, what? until December. So all of those like before that's are kind of short periods of time. <laughs> <laughs> what is... Did you say a data scientist? Mm -hmm. What is that? Okay, so uh, it's it's kind of like how computer science used to be this like sort of small ish field, and uh, maybe people specialized in little bits of things, but more or less everything sort of overlapped with everything. Mm -hmm. And then now there's like front end and back end, and there's this and there's that, and there's all kinds of stuff, right? And so data science has gone kind of the same way. So at a super high level, it's the study of, of data and like manipulating data and learning things from data and so on. It's a subset of artificial intelligence. Um, and they sometimes get used interchangeably. Um, machine learning is a type of data science. And of course that is also associated with artificial intelligence. So it's, it's in that like genre. Ooh. Interesting. There's so I'm much. Just realizing that my microphone is not in front of my face. Oh, I, yeah. Like your, <laughs> your microphone sounds even better. Sorry. I I am very lazy about my microphone, and mm. so I use my cool little headphones because I'm mm. like, you know, I I don't I don't like a microphone in front of my face. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, all right, so I think that does make a bit of sense because from like. When I started this journey of Teach Gen Tech, which is not even two months old, which is bananas to me, almost two months ago, um, I heard from a lot of people that Python was more of like back end stuff and JavaScript was all front end. And that um, that was a big reason I started with JavaScript. Now, could you, and later this week we'll have Ian on uh, from Postman and he's going to be talking about like why you may choose like one over the other, like why you would use JavaScript or why you would use Python. I think perfect timing of, you know, it follows up for today. But Is that Ian Douglas? Yes. Oh, I was just on his show like two weeks ago. <laughs> nice. Yeah, he's so cool. Uh, so he's going to be on and I think that's a great opportunity since I... I'm learning this from you today, yet I, I guess, like, especially since I heard Python does more like data and data mining and that kind of thing, I, I'm i scared about this one. Okay. Um, because it's like, for me at the moment, at the moment, maybe it's not going to be that complicated, but it's like harder to conceptualize that kind uh that code is doing that. Like it's, I don't know. It's this has been a big journey for myself of like, oh yeah, it's that is how something is made instead of it just magically happened. Okay. So I'm excited about learning about it today. Also, yeah, like yeah. we'll see how how much it like sinks in or not. Sure. I mean, um you can use Python for all kinds of stuff. You know, you can deploy apps to the web. Um, with Python, like with um, oh. frameworks like Django and Flask and so on. So it's not exclusively a data thing. Okay. Um, but it is, I think, one of the easiest programming languages to learn. Like, I think it's the maybe the best. I'm saying okay. maybe because, you know, I have a math background. And so I can't say definitively that something is the best, if there's any possibility that that might not be true for some edge cases, right? Basically, I think it's the best. Um, okay. programming language for someone to learn because it's it's a lot less fiddly and we'll see we'll see sort of how that works out okay yeah. I dig it mm -hmm. all right so I don't even know where to start all right cool um let's see do you have that link or I can grab it for um the book automate the boring stuff with python I... by Al Swigert 
do. Give me a second. I will grab that. I'm grabbing it off screen because I'm really bad at like forgetting that kind of stuff and having to go back to Twitter, but I've got it here shortly. Ta-da! Yay! All right. Is that big okay. enough? I always feel like I don't make my browser. It looks enough. good to me. Cool. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. And so I, when I started learning, okay. So I, the first programming language that I learned any of um, was HTML way back in the day, um, the GeoCities days. Um, and, and then um, I learned some Perl. Um, which is not very common these days, but it's kind of Python-like. Um, and then I learned C++ in a computer science class, and I could not okay. believe how fiddly C++ was compared to um, Perl. And so Python was very refreshing to me because it felt like felt more like Perl, except okay. even better. And I tried a bunch of different resources, um, including this one. And this one was my favorite for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and Al Swigert is really active on Twitter. And I like when I was working on a on a one of the exercises in this book, I had a question. I DM'd him and he literally answered me in like 20 minutes. What? And we had a whole conversation. So he is the tremendous bestest um for for this, I think. Okay. Um, and he's made this book available, you know, for free. So you can buy the physical book or um an copy of the book, which I highly recommend to support Al's amazing community efforts. Um, for today, we can just use the browser version, though. And that's that's interesting and good to know. I think um, something that you and I were talking about beforehand is like you learned from using this. And I'm like, this is this is probably one of the biggest reasons I never got into code before this. Like I took. <laughs> I took a, um, uh, I think it was C sharp class and, um, in, in my many random tangents of, uh, university and it never communicated because it was a lot of like reading the text to be able to create things. And I, this is probably almost probably 15 years ago. And, I wasn't getting it, but I needed to pass the class. <laughs> so uh -huh. I ended up uh, hiring someone off a of Craigslist to do my homework and make the mistakes because it just, it didn't make sense. And I love now that there's like um, applications that we can use for the um, tech and to, um, you know, screen readers or uh, text to speech that's helped so much. And then also learning my own learning styles. Like that's a big reason that I started teach Gen Tech is I was trying to do like LinkedIn or Code Academy and that's just not syncing in the same way mm -hmm. where when I get to learn about all this random shit and then I get to go, ooh, teach me the things and let me ask you all the questions because if I don't learn that how a goes to M and kind of associates with Z, I'm going to get really stuck on it and mm -hmm. then not be able to move forward. So yep. I super appreciate you coming on the show and sure thing. Excited to yeah, learn I think we, we, it sounds like we have pretty similar learning styles. So perfect. Sweet. Sweet. All right. What? So we're going through here yep. and I honestly didn't even look at it before today. No worries. Yep. You can scroll past all the boilerplate. Um, and I think we don't necessarily need to read the introduction, although he does, he does call out like um, in the who this, sorry, if you scroll up just a little bit, like who this book is for mm -hmm. um, and, and, and specifically says, you know, countless books, interactive web tutorials and developer boot camps promise to turn ambitious beginners into software engineers with six figure salaries. This book is not for those people. It's for everyone else. Interesting. Uh, I dig that because, yeah, that is. <laughs> and that's why I really like that this has been starting to build a community because mm -hmm. being able to show people that they can learn no matter what their learning style is and 
also giving them an opportunity to ask questions and an outlet mm-hmm. to ask questions. Yeah. So I, I love, now I yes. love it even more. Yes. So. Yes. Um, okay. And so if we keep going, um, do, do, do. Yeah. And so since you already have experience with a programming language, I figure we won't necessarily talk about everything like this part, like what is programming? And we basically know, you know, um, know that. And anybody who wants to read that, of course, can follow the link and read all of this good stuff. Um, Yes. And to that point, I will put the link will be also added to uh, the description, but it will also be commented right here. So it went to um, both YouTube and Twitch. Mm -hmm. What is Python? Yeah. Um, and so, so it does, it does actually come from Monty Python. Um, and there was a great interaction once, um, when, uh, one of, one of the people from, I think it was, um, maybe Michael Palin from, um, Monty Python, saw the word Python trending on Twitter and was like, oh, haha, you know, I thought it was going to be about us, but it was actually about the programming language. And then um, Guido, oh, I can't remember his last name. Anyway, he wrote Python. And uh, he was like, but it is kind of actually about you. Also, hi, <laughs> Mr. Monty Python person. And they had this whole little like, oh, that's nice. Who are you? I'm this, you know, it was just oh, so cute. like one of those, God, I love the internet. <laughs> yes, I would say it's so cool because I think this is my 16th or 17th episode and everyone I have met except Ian, Ian I met in person, mm-hmm. um, everyone else I have met through Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually don't know how to do a career without Twitter, like, and that's not and I didn't even know, really know how to use Twitter before um, this this journey. Uh, mm-hmm. So I started Thanks. using Twitter in June. Okay. And now I'm like, it's so fun. Mm-hmm. Yep. A little too yeah. Much people fun, are but... people are always like, oh, you need to be, you know, on LinkedIn for whatever. And I'm like, I guess. I mean, yes, you should have a, a LinkedIn profile. But should you be spending a lot of time on LinkedIn? I just... I don't really buy it. You know, I think it's, I think if you're going to spend time on a social media platform and you're looking for a job in tech, the one that you should be spending your time on is Twitter. Yeah. I dig Um, it. I dig it. Okay. Hey. Um, And then we've got, um, I feel like you, you know, a lot of math, but I'm excited about this. mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so, I mean, at, since you've already done, um, some programming, then you know that you don't need to know a lot of math in order to be a programmer. Um, why do you, uh, I guess I don't know where that idea came from that you have to know a lot of math. Um, so I suspect it came from, I kind of want to say two places, but maybe it's sort of the same place in the end. The original computer scientists were mathematicians, full stop, like Alan Turing. What was his degree in? Math. Okay. Um, he, would he have referred to himself as a computer scientist? No. <laughs> you know, he was a mathematician. And so, and this, and so it really, it really arose from, from math. Um, okay. And the other thing is that if you're doing a computer science degree at a university, you will be required to work through up through like probably calculus one and you'll probably Mm -hmm. have to take discrete math. I forgot about that because I did not realize that I was incredibly dyslexic and, you know, me in school in general, um, Mm -hmm. being ADHD and all that. But um, I would always fail math. Like I've had, what up Ramon? I always had to like take mm-hmm. multiple math classes. The sa- like I think I've taken algebra one three times. Then you haven't taken it as many times as I have. What? True story. Yeah. Well, I still haven't passed. <laughs> I just kind of gave up on okay. that degree. I was just like, what up, Noel? I'm just um, saying I took algebra one a whole bunch of times. I took calculus one 
four times before you, three, three times, three times. Yeah. I have graduate degrees in math. But I just, <laughs> you, you are reminding me why I also didn't continue down a computer science degree because mm -hmm. it's, um, I, I would do the math, like, you know, the, uh, the right problem solving skills, but I never realized how much I disposed my numbers and, mm -hmm. um, even in the calculator. So like, even though the pro, like if it was written, right. Oh, it just yeah. makes me happy to hear, not happy, but kind of happy that I yeah. feel very validated. You know, and it's interesting too. I feel like, I mean, this is way off topic, but I feel like we do math a huge disservice because there's, um, there's just so much stuff that's fun in math, like graph theory, which sounds like you're doing a bunch of like making graphs and so on, but it's all like, it's all nodes, like connected to other nodes. And you're actually drawing pictures of these nodes talking to each other and like how they're connected and like studying all of those things. And I, I always say I like my math with as few numbers as possible and people's minds are blown because they're like, what is math without numbers? But it's there's this whole world of math with symbols that aren't numbers. And it's, it, yeah. So anyway, it's super cool. There's all kinds of cool stuff in there. Yeah, I feel like maybe one day I'll go back, mm -hmm. but like something that I'm, I'm realizing as an adult that it's taken me a really long time is to focus on one thing at a time and not to mm -hmm. try to do everything at once. Sure. So sure. Um, I say that because I should probably get back to this, but also <laughs> um, in the fact that like I used to be like, oh, I can learn coding and to do math and to do baking. I don't know. I'm totally okay. making this up, but sure. You only do all of them half ass unless you like actually focus at one of them. I think it depends on the person. Ooh. So okay. I I have I feel like my my so I also have ADHD and I feel like my brain has three channels. And I have to kind of have all three of them going at once. Um mm -hmm. or else whichever one I'm trying to use, the other two will just start doing random stuff. Like I can either fill those channels with something intentional or they will fill themselves, but they're not going to be empty, you know, almost ever. And um, so for me having um, actually, and, and so this happened to you all the time when I was a math student, um, I would be working on a problem. I'd get super stuck. I had to go do something else. And then I'd come back and be like, oh, it's this. Like, why did not thinking about this for two hours suddenly mean that I figured out something that I had been thinking about for four hours and didn't get to the answer, you know? That, and so I feel you having, there. yeah. And so like you can, and so maybe, maybe that thing is like, okay, I'm just going to go for a walk or I'm going to go make dinner or something like that. But if it's, if, if you are fortunate enough as I have been sometimes to be able to devote a lot of your work time to studying for me, if I spend all of that time studying one topic, I am going to get something out of it, but not as much as I would have done if I had spent that time studying like three topics. I get you there. I think for, I, I feel very, very similar. I think it's mm -hmm. when I mention it, it's more of like mattering on the difficulty of what I'm learning. Totally. So like baking yeah. is going to be completely different. Like I don't sure. know anything about baking. So mm -hmm. that's going to be completely different than coding yep. that is not using like the same wavelength yep. where like I have my podcast, Shit You Don't Want to Talk About. Then I have Teach Gen Tech. Then I'm an API co-organizer for the meetup here in Denver. And then, you know, starting a new part-time job. Like, they're all on the same wavelength. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot easier to conceptualize where, dude, I feel okay. Like, this, you just got to join on Wednesdays. Because, like, Wednesday, <laughs> we do a Twitter space talking about mental health, neurodivergency, and tech. Mm -hmm. And I feel like... This is such an important topic. Yeah, love to. Yes, yes. And yes, Noelle, like, I don't know why we take Algebra 1 so much, but I do like the fact that 
we're never too old to learn programming. I feel that I'm 34. Mm-hmm. I feel like an old lady and I'm learning it. I'm excited. I do know why we take algebra one a lot of times. <laughs> oh, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> um, it's because um, it's the first time that you're pulling together all kinds of different things that you've been learning since you were four. You're pulling them all together to do them at the same time. Because previously we were doing like, right now we're doing multiplication Mm -hmm. and then we're doing division Mm -hmm. and then we're going to do fractions and then decimals and then long division or something and then integers and so on. So we're doing all of these things siloed. Mm -hmm. And then in algebra, we're bringing them all together for the first time, which means that we're having to relearn the ones that we forgot. We're Mm -hmm. having to unlearn things we thought we understood that were incorrect and um, having to, and, and yeah, so, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to cough. <clears throat> having to use them all together and um, like use them to solve problems. So it's like, if you've spent, you know, all of your time learning how to use a hammer and you're just doing the hammer by itself. And mm-hmm. then two weeks later, you're just doing the screwdriver. And a few weeks later, you're doing the, saw or something then then all then you bring them all together to make an actual project the project is not going to come out very well the first time it yeah. might not even come out great the second time by the third time you're starting to get the hang of it right I algebra is a project all right Interesting. and learning new tools it's both it's like learning it's using all the tools that you've been amassing for six years using those all together and learning some new ones. So like, of course, it's going to take some time. Interesting. The only reason that we feel like it's a problem is because we get graded on Mm -hmm. how quickly we can mash these things together. And have to repay for another semester of the same class. That too. And people, people, and there's like shame involved in it and so on. So, yeah. yeah. Oh so my that's, gosh. That's why it's not algebra's fault. Okay. But anyway. <laughs> I like that. I like that. It's not algebra's fault. Now yeah. I am like so curious. And uh, if you said it was uh, Al, uh, how do you say Swigert? his last name? Swigert. If he's neurodivergent as well, because making this book. But so I have Al, a pet if you, theory. That... ever hear this mm-hmm. come hang out with us that's all i got yes yes um oh we could we could tag him too um and Done. yeah yeah and i i mean i can't speak for al swigert i don't actually know al swigert personally i mean we've we chatted once like two years ago on dm um but anyway um i have a pet theory that is actually borne out by data that um neurodivergent people tend to be um tend to have good vibes with other neurodivergent people. And so if somebody likes, if a neurodivergent person likes somebody's vibes, the the odds that that person is also neurodivergent are quite high. Cannot speak for it. I dig it. Al, look, we've already <laughs> tagged you on Twitter. I'm just going to tag you all the time now to, <laughs> to check this out. All right. So I'm going just to the overview. So we mm-hmm. got Part one, uh, Python programming basics. And so chapter one is the basics, yep. uh, covers expressions, the most basic type of Python instruction, and how to use Python interactive shell software to experiment with code. Chapter two, flow control. Um, I'm, I'm scrolling through this because sure. there's a lot here. And I know we are starting at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And Anybody that wants to come check this out, they can. Uh-huh. Um, so, yeah. So let's pause here. Yes. So I was like, hey, <laughs> this is what we're looking for. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, so we um, definitely want to use Python 3 and not Python 2 because Python 2 is no longer supported. That's relatively recent. Like, um, okay. Maybe maybe two years ago, that, that Python 2 was unsupported. Okay. Um, all right. So we'll go. We'll go get Python. Hmm. Based. 
and then hey look it's the latest version mm -hmm. I'm writing my readme in the other screen. Oh, sure. And if I can get used to at least taking the notes while we're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I used to do that. Um, or I, I, I sort of still do. Um, I made them into blog posts. And it's literally how I got my job. For the record. Yeah, that's actually what um, I want to do is mm -hmm. go back and start blogging about them. I wrote my mm -hmm. first blog last week. Oh, like I've nice. never published a blog before. So mm -hmm. um, that's a big reason that I'm like wanting to pay more attention to my readmes because now that Anthony, who was on last week, started to explain it, I'm like, oh, that makes like so much more sense to mm -hmm. be able to get someone to be able to do it. Okay. Right. So I need to go into my code folder, uh, which I should probably update. Oh, no. I should see where I'm at. at. Yeah. Okay. At one point, I will uh, make it so it's my default folder. I haven't yet. All right. I'm in the proper folder now. And OK. Warning, Windows, Terminal. So if, but we're not running this, right? We're not in Ubuntu. At least it looks like you're in Mac OS. OK. So I need to However, um, Ubuntu is a flavor of Linux. It's a Linux distribution. Um, and Linux is Unix. And Mac OS is secretly also Unix. So pro tip, if you find something that works, on, um, works in a Linux terminal, it also works in a terminal on Mac OS. Huh. I'm going to go back to this one because it... Mm -hmm. Uh, doesn't have look like it has the um, uh, that's for the system. Let's see. Thank you for giving me a second to like read through yeah, these no and like work on Mac mm -hmm. OS. Download the file, double click mm -hmm. on it. Interesting. So it just like installs it like a program instead yeah. of like. A lot of them I've had to do NPM installs instead you, of like this. Yeah. And so um, it's not an NPM install because that's a JavaScript thing, right? It's ah. no. <laughs> there are um, like there's um, pip install and conda install for Python. Um, but if we're just okay. getting started, we don't necessarily, we don't have to do those. So we'll just do this. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. I thought that was just like an install anything kind of thing, not necessarily a Java job I mean, thing. So it's it's associated, like it's it's part of Node. So it's not just installing JavaScript things, but um it is a package manager um for JavaScript things and sort of related things. And then there's um like pip. Pip is the one that you use. If you are a Python person, then pip is your NPM. Oh, pip is the okay. one that you pip install this and you pip install that. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, hold on. Ryan, that Conda is another notes. option, but I haven't used that one too much. Okay. So downloading and installing. Okay. Let's make sure we finished installing Python first. Um, all right, so it looks like I see it in your um, applications folder. So I think that we are probably good there. Um, Am I okay. using the Python launcher? Let's see what it does. Um, I have actually only Ooh. used it through um, Anaconda. Um, okay, is this is this is this a safe for work stream? No. Okay, cool because. I have a very not safe for work thing to say about this. Um, the, the, the way that I first started interacting with, like directly with Python was through um, a program called Anaconda. And the uh, instructor of the course that I was looking at at the time um, 
said, you know, okay, Anaconda is, is, is great um, because it'll, it'll like install everything for you. Um, but um, it's, it's, uh, and I, I had a little like internal snicker at the word Anaconda, right? I get it. Cause like it's Python, it's a snake, but like, you know, sir makes a lot. Haha. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. And then he goes on and he says that um, the thing is about Anaconda um, that it, uh, it takes up a lot of space. <clears throat> it's pretty big. Um, and so, like, if you don't have room for the full Anaconda, there's another distro called Miniconda that you can use instead. And I was absolutely deceased. I am a ghost. I do not live anymore. I died three years I, ago. I feel like, <laughs> you know, the creators of Python and Anaconda knew this. And they are having fun with everybody I that. just could not believe that he said it with a straight face. If you don't have room for the full Anaconda, you can install Mini Conda. I'm anyway. not going to lie. Like, as soon as you said on <laughs> Anaconda, I'm like, yeah, that song just popped in my hand. Hey. Mm -hmm. So, yep, yep. Right. Okay. Anyway, so um, let's close this for now. Easy peasy. Um, and I, since you have already said that you would like to use. Um, you wanted work it, do it in the terminal yes. instead of in VS Code. We will proceed to um, Mew. Mew, okay. Mm -hmm. um, which I think is a, I have not personally used it. So this is where we're going to be learning it together, and that's cool. Um, um, I strongly suspect Python that it's Jupiter. going to, yeah. Okay. So we'll see. If this ends up being an IDE sort of along the lines of VS Code, I think maybe we should just do VS Code. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Well, we're okay. Uh, okay. Sure. Let's do that. Sure. Interesting. Another way to do this is through VS Code by installing um, the plugin for Python. Lots and lots of options. So this is not actually going to be, I had, I misunderstood about what Mu is and I thought it was going to be a way that you can just write Python in the terminal. It's not, it's basically like a little mini IDE um, along the lines of VS Code. So we can use it for VS Code, whichever you like. Um, what is a uh, IDE? Um, integrated development environment. So VS Code is an IDE. Okay. Is that kind of like Code Sandbox then? <sighs> code Sandbox can be integrated into an integrated development environment. Um, it, it kind of is an IDE in itself, sort of. Okay. And then click new edit. We install. Oh, you know what would be kind of fun? We could do mu this time. And since we've already decided that we would love to do this again, um, yes. we can do it in different ways. We can do it in mu this time. We can do it in VS Code sometime. Um, and we can do it in the terminal. Yo, it's Ben. Uh, he said, let, I need to start looking at getting these on the screen better. Uh, I like to think about IDEs as editors with superpowers. Oh, mm -hmm. I like it. I like it. Yeah, I need to, there's so much to learn here. And Ben, as a random update, because I, I tagged him in this, um, I had a very very curiosity question of this weekend of, while well, this is installing, of um, why GIFs don't come with uh, alt text. Oh, yeah, I think I saw that conversation. Yeah, and so it's been like, I haven't started using my alt text yet, like I should, but it's like, it's been in the back of my mind. So like, mm -hmm. I'm not typing them yet, but I'm like, is this what I should type? So I just want to let you know, Ben, ever since you were on the show, now I'm like, it's like stuck in my head mm -hmm. thinking about it. Okay. 
the first time you run select a mode. Oh. First time you run select a mode window will appear add a fruit circuit python bbc micro that Pi game zero and Python three. Select Python three. You can always change the mode later by clicking mode button. Oh, okay. Open. Okay. Interesting. I don't know why I'm so fascinated about this right now. He's yeah, very entertaining. Fun. I haven't I haven't seen it. I haven't used it before. I love the little um sneaky thing and its little friend. Was it a bird? It's gone now. It had a friend. Did it eat the friend? It didn't. It is a bird. Hmm. Huh. I think this is also like I've been doing all JavaScript for like the last month and a half that mm -hmm. now redoing this on Python, I'm like, what is all of this? It's so different. Mm -hmm. oh, Python three. Yes. That's the mode we want. All right. Ooh, that was fun. All right. Make this, see if we can get these guys next to each other. Uh Oh, Ben got us back on the alt text. Anthony did a great job tackling that. Basically, alt text is contextual, and two people posting the same graphic may might be doing so for different reasons and to different audiences. So it's hard to specifically to spe specify one true alt text for everyone. And even if GIF keyboards did supply predefined alt text, they probably also need to support a bunch of languages. User might speak, etc. So a really hard problem. Touche. Touche. I was also thinking about it like on, um, oh, there's idle. Okay. Um, really quick as like not knowing the context of the GIF. Maybe that's just me not knowing GIFs, like how to use them properly. I mean, there are all kinds of GIFs that I don't, I don't actually know where they came from, but I've seen how they've been used. You know, you see it used in the same context a few times. And so you get to understand what, what folks mean. Fair enough. And what up, Anthony? All right. So this book uses Moo as an editor and interactive shell. However, you can use a number of editors. Um, the integrated development and learning environment software installs along with Python, and it can serve as a good second editor. Let's back burner idle since we have Mew running already. Cool. That's why I was like, wait, what? And we got interactive shell. When you run Mew, the window appears, and it is called file editor window. You can open the interactive shell by clicking the repel. Repl? It's Repl? pronounced REPL. REPL? It turns out, yeah. Oh. Button. A shell program, uh, a shell is a program that lets you type instructions into the computer like terminal or command on command prompt on Mac OS, respectively. So do we need idle with Mew? Um so Mew is a, uh, it, it has an interactive shell. So we're looking at it right now because that's where it says, write your code here. That's okay. where you can type. Okay. That's the shell. Okay. Cool. Um, and we don't need to be looking at um, idle right now. Do, do. Okay. Shall we hello world? Yeah. All right. And so um, in a Python context um, to print, you just print and then in parentheses, you write your string in either single quotes or double quotes. So this is something that had me messed up um, the other day for like an hour and a half because I come from Python world where you can use single and double quotes depending on what you like. Um, single quotes are more common. 
and I am currently learning Go. And you can't just use single and double quotes interchangeably. But it didn't want to tell me that that was what was wrong. And so oh. I spent an hour and a half trying to figure out what the fuck was wrong with my code. And it was because I used single quotes and it wanted doubles. Yeah, that is something that I've also just learned to go actually exists. Mm -hmm. And then enter. Let's enter the yeah, interactive yeah. shell should display this prompt. Okay. So, okay, maybe, yeah, let's, let's, let's try that. Maybe Sweet. we need to configure it. Ugh. Aha, okay. So yeah, we need to save the file. Okay. Desktop. What's everybody else working on today? Because this is this is exciting and yet really nerve-wracking doing <laughs> this. Save as Laura is cool. <laughs> oh, it worked. Yay. Oh, Anthony recorded a podcast about TypeScript. Oh, nice. That is exciting. I'm going to learn mm -hmm. about TypeScript in September. Ooh. All right. You've given computer instruction and it did what it told you to do. Do we, well, this is where it took, talked about PIP, mm -hmm. but we don't necessarily need to do installing third-party modules right now, right? Um. Yeah, so at, at the at the last sentence of that paragraph, it says consult Appendix A when this book instructs you to install a particular third-party module. So yep, we can back burner this and it will let us know when we need them. And this, this is one of the reasons that I think that this book is exceptional because not very many books or courses teach you how to find solutions to your coding problems on the internet, like actually teach you how to do it. And this one does. Hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, and so, so he gives this example. So for example, let's cause an error on purpose. So we're going to enter string 42 plus three. So with nothing with it, which is going to be weird. Okay. String 42 plus three, enter. Um. What if you stop and then run it again? Click stop um, there, yeah, and then run. There we go. Okay, so type error, it can only concatenate, and concatenate means like put one in front of the other, um, a string, not an integer. So it's saying, I don't know what on earth you mean when you say to stick this string with this, to attach this string to this integer, this 42 string to this integer three. Makes no sense. So then what do we do? Um, and so this error message appears because Python couldn't understand the instruction and the trace back. And so, and that's important because if you end up on, um, Stack Overflow, people will sometimes ask you, what's the traceback? And being able and knowing what that means is handy. Um, um, is a traceback mm -hmm. kind of like a trace route when you need to be able to find where something is not connecting, like a website's not connecting with the server or only connects to localhost or something like that? So if you look at it, so it says um, traceback and then in parentheses, most recent call last, and it gives you the file. It tells you like where that's running okay. on your machine. Um, and, and then he says, if you're not sure what to make of a particular error message, search for it online. And so you, you just copy and paste that whole trace back and, and then search for it in quotations. So let's just do that just to see what that looks like. Mm. 
So that, that type error can only concatenate string, not int to string. Copy that whole thing. And open up a search engine. Put, and search for that in quotation marks, yep. OK, and the quotation marks matter, um, as you may already know, because that way we're searching for, we want these exact words in this exact order. And so that way we're going to find this exact error message. Mm -hmm. And so if you go back to automate the boring stuff mm -hmm. um, and scroll down. And so he's got a little you know, image of what, what that looks like, like we just found, um, and says that you'll, you'll often find that someone else had the same question as you and some other helpful person has already answered it. Mm -hmm. um, and so then he goes on to talk about how to ask smart programming questions. And this is another sort of mind blowing moment because this is, this is almost the only time that I've ever seen it in a course or a book where they actually teach you how to ask good programming questions. Um, and that's a total skill. Um, and so we don't need to read all of this. I just wanted to call it out because I think that it's so exceptionally good um, that when we're asking good programming questions, we want to explain what we're trying to do, what we've already done, how, how, exactly how it failed to do what we expected it to do and all of that kind of stuff. And so this is a great, like, if we if we have if we come up with a question, we can refer back to this page, and make sure that when we ask a question, we are asking it in the um, most efficient way. And the the more efficiently we can ask a question, the more likely we are to get our question answered. Right. And the friendlier people will feel toward us when they are answering our questions. It's a total thing. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, well, I can go through those all later. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we don't need to look at that specific um, error message. Just, just that this is an example of of how, say, we found this error. This is how we could um, debug it by figuring stuff out for ourselves by looking for answers on online, or um, by actually asking questions like on Stack Overflow or um, as he specifies here, um, he blogs, um, Al Swigert does, and um, and is on um, Twitter and Reddit. Okay. We made it through chapter one. Chapter zero. Chapter zero. We made it through chapter zero. <laughs> we are, we're getting somewhere. Yeah. So if we click that right arrow, then we'll be in chapter one. And I don't know if everybody else is seeing this as um, this is something that I I don't need to use it right now because I don't think anybody will hear it with using StreamYard. But this is how I get through online text mm -hmm. is a um, plugin called called something it hmm. is called why won't you oh, natural, natural reader, reader. i use yeah. that too <laughs> yeah it helps so much and mm -hmm. it's definitely something i highly highly suggest if anybody has a hard time with this kind of stuff because it used to be they didn't exist which they do now so you can catch up on everybody else even if you're dyslexic and um if you are i'm not dyslexic but i use it for because with my ADHD, I'll realize like I've read five paragraphs, like my eyes moved over them, but I stopped paying attention to what my eyes were looking at two paragraphs ago. Um, and whereas if I can listen and do something with my hands, mm -hmm. I can actually retain all the information. The other <sighs> thing that I use it for is when I'm writing, I have it read my writing back to me. Oh, yes. hundred percent. Yep. And um, to make sure that I'm not missing words, because that's a thing that I do. I have things that are fun to yeah. mess with while I'm learning other stuff. So I totally my, get that. I used to work in a bookstore when I was a teenager. And one of my coworkers, um, her son-in-law was the guy who invented that. What? The hand thing that you're, the, yeah. the, pin, the pin thing. Yeah. Ward 
something. Anyway, yeah, he invented that when he was like 19. Um, they don't make it like the pins anymore. They don't make the metal pins. They make plastic mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Made me very sad. I found this at a garage sale and I was very excited about that. But <laughs> um, they don't make the these ones anymore. Yeah. But all right. So, hey, it actually. OK, so we has a wide range of syntactical constructions. OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, so programming concepts. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Yep. <clears throat> Interesting. And then we're using an interactive shell right now, right? Yep. And then it's called, you said, REPL? REPL. Mm -hmm. REPL. Um, which is read, evaluate, print, loop. Uh, Python instructions at one time instantly shows you results. Okay. Yep. Cool. This is showing how to go into Mu mm -hmm. and wants us to save an empty file. We started a file, so mm -hmm. I'm probably so just going to go. keep it the same. But mm -hmm. says two plus two should work now. We do it like this. Now try ah, trying to see if does that mean he has spaces? Like is it gonna work if I do it like that? It will. Um it's um conventional to use spaces in between for readability sake, but the computer will not care either way. Um Okay, um, so do, 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 oh, wait, okay, click stop. Is REPL, yeah. is, is REPL grayed out? Um, no. Ah, okay, there we go. Type it in there. Oh, okay. There okay. we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then I'm going to go so back over here for So what's the difference between REPL and run? So notice that when when you ran the your program right there, it was running everything. So it printed hello beautiful humans and if we had written like x equals 2 plus 2 um and then printed x then it would have said four, x equals four. Okay. Um, and and so on. So, but it would it would do everything, everything that you wrote. It would do all of it. Whereas in the REPL, it's running one line at a time. So you have to type the line here for what you mm -hmm. want it to run. Yeah. So um, a REPL is really handy for if you want to check your syntax without running your entire program, which matters a lot more when you have a really big program that might take a while to run. And then you don't want to have to run something that takes, you know, five or 10 minutes to, to go to, to figure out whether you've got your syntax right or, or whatever. So it's a nice little way of, of checking Checking if stuff's working one line at a time. Okay. Give me a second. I'm adding sure this to my notes of run versus. Okay. Cool. Um, not going to lie. This is, I mean, like it's similar, but it's still like awfully confusing compared to JavaScript at this point. Okay. Well, okay. When you're comparing Python to JavaScript, what do you mean? Like the like typing two plus two is confusing compared to JavaScript or like in JavaScript, um there's gonna be like more in front of this, like telling it what it's gonna 
do. And then like there's the spacing that's also mm -hmm. weird. And then just being able to like that there is a difference of run versus uh ripple repel 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 um okay but REPL is not a Python thing. Oh, it's an everything okay. thing. So you can do this with JavaScript. And um, so, so, so yeah, that's, that's not, yeah, not, not a difference between Python and JavaScript. Um, and I think maybe what you mean when you say that there would be stuff in front of this is like, you'd have a variable declaration mm -hmm. and you're going to in Python. Okay. So like if you were, if in, in that top window, you would be writing it with the variables in the bottom window, in the REPL, it's letting you just test things super fast. Like it's, it's almost like a, it's, it's a scratch pad that you can execute. If that makes sense. Yeah. And Anthony just said that I haven't been using a REPL, so I can yeah. do the same thing there. The browser console is a REPL. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So yeah. code sandbox would be a REPL, I would think then. I haven't used it, um, so I don't know. Press option, command I, and you'll see a JavaScript REPL. Okay. Code sandbox is an IDE. Yeah. Okay. All the, all the fun things. Option, command I. Press option, command, I. Probably within the browser. Oh. Uh, there you go. Oh. Okay. Now it's starting to click. Yep. We're getting there. And, yep. And You're right down there, there in that console was, was the REPL. Got it. Yep. Got it. Yep. Okay. It's clicking now. I'm picking yeah. up what you're putting down. All right, so, and it looks like just looking at this is where we were just about to get two expressions. Mm -hmm. Right, and so this is this is going to work exactly the same way as it does in math. And so this is another sort of all, a lot of the programming constructs and like expressions and so on um, come from, from math um, because the only way that computers can do anything that we think of as thinking is they're always doing math. Like that's, that's it for them. Um, so uh, in math, an expression is like two plus two. It's not an equation because an equation has to contain an equal sign, mm -hmm. right? And so this is an expression and we would need to give that an equal sign, in fact, if we wanted to assign it to a variable, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, and so... In Python, so the expressions always evaluate down to a single value. So if you if you said x equals 2 plus 2, then the value won't be like a string 2 plus 2. It'll be the value, the mathematical value of 2 plus 2, which is 4. So okay. you can say x equals 4, and you can say x equals 2 plus 2, and those will mean the same thing. Okay. All right. Um. Okay, so let's keep going. Mm. Errors are okay. Yay. Mm -hmm. Glad to yes. see that. Yep. Um, there is ah, a good link for error mm -hmm. messages, which yep. I will put that in the chat too. I'm also putting it in my own notes. Mm -hmm. And then use plenty of other operators in Python expressions too, for example. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's put a pin in this table um because we'll come back to it um so more or less it's going to work the same way as order of operations do in math there are some exceptions 
um, mainly to do with um, division. Um, okay. I, I don't know. I'm feeling a little noodled on. I got a noodle on it because I sure. think something that would help before next time too. Uh, and of course it's like learning that I, that they, how do I say this? A lot of times when I've been learning like check flask, what Anthony, what do you mean? Flask is a framework for deploying Python apps to the web. Oh. Another one is um, Django, D-J-A-N-G-O. Okay. And check those out. Um, it's like, like Express. Okay. That could be it too. Is like, it definitely, um, they're a lot different, but also I don't think that when I started learning JavaScript, it wasn't like I was really comparing it to too much of anything because it was right. the first one I learned where now yeah. I'm like, as you said, like with algebra, you have to unlearn and relearn what you already know. Mm -hmm. So I'm just having like, I'm picking up what you're putting down yet at the same time, it's not fully sinking in. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, but I think having, but, oh, go ahead. Yeah. It's, I, f I think that at least for me, like I sort of, understood English better when I started studying a foreign language because I hadn't properly thought about like what a verb was mm -hmm. and so on and like where it fits in a sentence relative to other things mm -hmm. whereas when you started studying um you know French and then eventually Spanish um it was like oh okay right so all these things that I've like intuitively I've never really thought about these things and like how they fit together but I intuitively understand because mm -hmm. I've been speaking English all my life or whatever and I think it works out to be kind of the same thing with programming languages. So if like you learn your first programming language and then when you're learning your second one, you understand your first one better because mm -hmm. you can map all these things that you sort of intuitively understood to a more formal infrastructure, if that makes any sense. So like here you're, you're learning, like you learn, like NPM was just like, this is the command. It's, it's you, you wave your magic wand, you say NPM and then things install, right? But like, what is that? It's a package manager. And oh, that makes more, like I understand NPM better now because now I know about the existence of PIP, which is another package manager. And I think it's if also that makes like, sense. it does. And I thought, that all package managers were basically the same, like that I did not realize that NPM was specific to JavaScript. Um, yeah, yarn. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I was I was struggling with yarn. And yeah. um, what what do you mean you learn the meta language, Anthony? I don't know if I understand that. Um. I'm going to speculate that so like like if you're learning something meta, you're learning instead of learning um, like in, in, in a math context, like you can learn, learn math and, or you can learn about like specific mathematical types of constructs um, or in, in a language, for instance, like if you're learning, you can learn Spanish mm -hmm. or you can learn about, this is a verb, this is a noun, this is a, you know, conjunctive or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Those are meta, like those are characteristics of a language or any language really, but not just characteristics of Spanish or English. Mm, yeah. It's a um, level up. Yeah. Uh, Anthony said uh, the meta language is uh, how languages work. And then um, Jay said Python has uh, pip x, uh, but isn't nearly as possible, but it does something similar to um, like. Uh, NPX. He was mentioning NPX. Uh, that is still confusing for him. So, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. We're going to, I'm excited that Laura has signed up to be on the show multiple times Me too. <laughs> because this is, it's definitely very, very interesting. It's just also a little mind boggling because mm -hmm. the, like even the install process was different of in not installing it through terminal, installing it through, you know, the finder view, um, mm -hmm. which you would think is just like super simple. That's how I've installed like 
all my other programs yet when it comes to like a language, I wasn't expecting it because I've done everything else through terminal and I'm like, Oh, that, but it makes sense. It's just thinking it through. Yeah. Yeah. And so like a lot of the things that you can install through say NPM or yarn, you can also go to their website and download it and install it that way. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, it's definitely something that is going to take a bit to sink in and I'll read through um, the next couple chapters first before mm -hmm. um, we have our next session because okay. I'm like this, this is taking me a minute to, to put two and two together, especially since there's stuff that is somewhat repetitive, but we may not need to use like, um, I'm trying to go back to it for an example. You're not sharing your screen anymore. Uh, yes. Yes, I know. Um, <laughs> like um, not realizing what um, in, uh, impromptu is. Is that what it's called? Uh, Here, I'm not share. sure. Can you show me? <laughs> I have to go back to it. I can't find it. Gosh, there we go. Um, but it's also like you learning like the um, idle terminology, that kind of stuff has also been new, uh -huh. but um, REPL is new. It's also just like, I just haven't had a chance to learn them yet. So like sure. you said, even though it's like, I'm learning what a noun is. So yeah, it's also like exactly also mind boggling exactly. where I'm like, oh, that's what it's called. I never right. knew that was a thing. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so and so I guess I would I would hate for um, you know, sometimes if if you if you're if a person is like struggling learning something because there are a bunch of other things that they need to learn like along with it, it gets like a bad rep or whatever for being being hard, actually math is one of those. Um, <laughs> right. And, and so I would, I would hate for like it to come across as like, Oh, Python is so hard because you have to learn all this stuff. All this stuff applies to all the programming languages. Like, yeah. Everybody can use a REPL and everything has expressions um, and so on assignment operators, all of that kind of stuff. All of them do. Yeah. And I think this is, this is great start to learn mm -hmm. of what I know about another language already. So yeah, I think yeah. that is a great example to be able to explain it to mm -hmm. others. And Do you set up a GitHub repo yeah, and push your readme? Right. Yeah. Okay. Let me get back there. There we go. Um, let's see. And Ramon says eventually those concepts will carry over with different names, um, with experience. And that's a total thing. Just like people say, you know, learning your first language is, is hard and then it gets easier and easier because you get sort of a sense for like, okay, how do I do this? And so mm -hmm. instead of thinking like, okay, well, what is a while loop? Then the, when you learn your second programming language, you say, how do I do a while loop in this language. Ah, yeah. And right? hey, Anthony, I am, you. it's just in notes, but I am making myself a read me. Just, just to let you know, I am doing <laughs> that. I am learning and getting the, you know, repetition of that, even though yep. I'm also writing it as a, hey, Jen, rem remember what the differences are. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I don't remember how to make a repo. <laughs> Let's go to GitHub. Okay. <laughs> this is... Um, there are lots of different ways to do almost all of these things. Yeah. Uh, you are up there. There we go. I don't know why it's in white right now, but it's white. Um, all right. So I said the other day that I made my first repo, and I guess mm -hmm. I didn't. It was more of like, this is the first one that I've realized that I made. Mm -hmm. That's a thing. Sure. <laughs> Didn't realize. Uh, so I guess I could create a new repository. Absolutely. Sweet. And Laura is cool. Okay. Or I could and say I learn love Python. that I am. I, I would. 
strictly to uh, make it easier for you to find it in the future. <laughs> I and know. if you want to share it with anyone else, they won't understand why I'm cool. So I'll put it in. Teaching me. Okay. That's what I'll start doing then. That's add a read me. There you go. Uh, yes. Okay. Is if you're going to make a read me, I would recommend that you make your um, repo public instead of private. Well, more like, I guess it's the other way around. Like, for them, usually a read me is for the sake of other people. I mm -hmm. mean, it could be for the sake of you, um, mm -hmm. but but if you want other people to be able to see it, I would do public. Okay. And I'm cool with making them public because, uh, like, if I go back here, we're going to go, look, it's black now. It was white, like, two seconds ago. Anyway, um, go into my React app. What I did with Anthony last week is, mm -hmm. yes, like, all of this up here is for others, but I put gen notes at the bottom sure. because I'm, like, I get that this is for everybody, but these are things that I got stuck on. So mm -hmm. maybe other people got stuck. So right. Yeah. And using using this as a framework for putting together um, a blog post eventually mm -hmm. makes a ton of sense. Um, in fact, um, what is it? Jason Langstorff had a post last week, I think. Yeah, it was last week called... Um, how to turn one piece of DevRel content into 10. Yes, I saw that one. Right? And yeah. this is kind of along those lines, right? Like you can make your repo with your readme, and then you can use that to build out your blog post. And this is a stream already, so that's three. Yes, and if I make clips of it, and also the transcript, and yes, yep. there's there's so much in it. Um, so we're not going to do a get ignore. And You can always add one later. And we don't need a license right now, right? I mean, there's sort of no harm in choosing. Usually um, the most common are like Apache and MIT. I genuinely have no idea what the difference is between those. Um, I think I usually default to MIT strictly because the first time I had to make that decision, I looked to see what um, some other group was using. Mm -hmm. and it was MIT. And so I was like, all right, okay. I'm going to do MIT. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah, if you um, click license. Really quick, um, I'm just going to show this mm -hmm. on here. Uh, this is the That's link the um, for to go find Jason's DevRel breakdown one to 10. Mm -hmm. And we will do licenses and go to MIT and create. Okay. Yay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's got two whole things. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then I will go into the README and create it from what we did so far today. It's already created. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I meant like add my notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can it? Okay, now that I'm in here, I don't even know if I can. You can edit it here. Yes, absolutely. Oh, that's exciting. Oh. Y'all, I haven't done much in GitHub now that I'm learning it. And mm -hmm. uh, let's yep. see. And Jay just said, uh, also be sure to add a code of conduct as well if you're going to have folks contribute. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say, hey, Ramon, on our um, live stream on Thursday, do you want to, uh, can we go over what the code of conduct for them are so I can see an example? <laughs> like Ramon and I have been, have, have in the past worked on a code of conduct for our uh, companies. Mm -hmm. And um, Ramon said, hey, you know where we should start? We should start with um, free code camps um, code of conduct because they have an excellent one. Okay. And so, yeah. And, uh, oh, and AJ's linked to another one as well yeah oh hey this is cool mm -hmm. jay is this what you normally use um for them or do you use something else i'm going to the second link oh cool it... 
in the other version of it. Oh, nice. I didn't know that, Jay. Um, uh, get cub, get, get cub, get cub. <laughs> That's the thing. Get cub, get cub. GitHub has a template built in as well. If you create a new file with the name code of conduct, it will make the file default. Thank you, Jay. That Let's is awesome. Go find where I put this. Too many tabs, y'all. Too many tabs. Okay. <laughs> so if I go here mm -hmm. and I add a file, create new file, mm -hmm. and I want code. Uh, on that. And oh, no cats. And B. Mm -hmm. And um, so MD is the um, file extension for Markdown for anybody who's wondering. Good call. Good call. Oh, and there's also a choose a code of tongue template nice. right here. I mean, words right now, y'all. Um, it's a thing. Look at the right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also, I think that's that code of conduct uh, template button that you were just. Referring. Yeah. And um, Jay, I feel like I need your help with VS Code because I try to open stuff in VS Code and from terminal and it doesn't work. Oh, so. I know this one. Or or we can wait for Jay. Um, well, I did. You, you know how you sent me the link of how to fix it? Mm -hmm. I may have broke terminal. <laughs> Can't have broken it. No, like you could, you couldn't do like LS lookup or CD or anything. It was, it was pretty entertaining. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Anthony helped me uh, figure that out, but um, <laughs> that's why I was like, Jay, <laughs> I awesome. need your help at some point. Um, this is cool. This is actually really, really cool. Huh. So if I go review and submit you work with codes uh folks you work with folks on vs code python experience oh score oh. way hey. more informed than i am then by far jay is like so informed and super super knowledgeable on all of this stuff I will say all of you are like all of you are really cool and like helping me like figure this stuff out. So I'm going to commit, commit this file. Oh no, I did a new branch. That's okay. Then we can merge it. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, pull request. Is that where you would merge it? From? Sure. Um, click the green one down there. Create pull request. Okay, now if this had anything more going on, you'd want to like maybe review it or well, since it's only you in here at the moment, <laughs> um, <Yes. laughs> you're good to go. Um, but yeah, so you can merge pull request. All right, and confirm merge. There we Yay. go. Yay. And now and you then... can delete your new branch. Oh, hey. And then. Go to, yay. yay. I'm going to put that in my notes too, because that was mm -hmm. dope. Mm -hmm. Me too. Uh, let's put this over here. So I remember to put it in my code, in my notes. All right. I keep forgetting that VS Code is a Microsoft thing. Um, Jay just said, um, just got to Microsoft earlier this year. And I was like, Microsoft, why does that matter? Oh, because good yeah. morning, Laura. VS Code is Microsoft. Right? I swear I'm awake. Yes, Jay, come join the stream. I will <laughs> yes, give you a link you later. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Super helpful. This was, this was, and so much knowledge drops and learning so much. And I'm, wait, I'm, wait, wait. one more yes. thing. Oh, Do we're we doing more. We one got more. more. I just wanted to put your um, Python file into your oh. repo. I mean, that would make sense. Uh, how do I do that? Okay, so um, there are a few different ways we can do that. Let's start with maybe the the like GUI oriented one, and then in a future stream, we'll do it from the terminal. Dig it. Okay, 
Cool. So um, go into your repo. Um, and it's good click guy. Add. Hello. Um, click add file. Upload. Uh, I should probably make sure this is saved. Good call. Um, choose file. And we went to desktop, code folder, this one, mm -hmm. open. We know this is the right file because the extension, the file extension is .py. So we know this is our Python file as opposed to any of the other things and, that could be there. Um, we're going to direct it directly to the main branch because this one is not, we don't have to, there's not an already existing file to go see the changes. Right. True. Um, if you were working, if other, if you had other people collaborating on mm -hmm. this, even though there aren't any changes, you might want somebody to review it just because it's new. Got it. And so in that case, you would, you would make a new branch, put it there, let them review it. And then assuming it's all good, then merge it in. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Hey, it's there. Yay. I don't know why I'm so excited about this, but it's totally it is fun. there. It's there. It is, it's a lot You've of it is it practice. There. That is why you I have my notes. a Python file. Yes. And you have a repo and a readme and a code of conduct. Yeah. First code of conduct. Look at all today. that. Yeah. I'm slowly building it up. Yay. Oh, we got a Python and I have CSS. Mm -hmm. CSS in here. I also have multiple accounts that I don't know what to do with, which I will figure that out mm -hmm. at a different point. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Yeah. Thank you. Great. I think we have hit all of our targets today and then some, yes. which is, which is pretty cool. Thanks to, thanks to Jay for that. Yeah. We got the crowd in. going. Yep. So many different, this is the one thing I love about live streaming is it's such like a community. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So much learning. All right, cool. Well, Everyone, thank you for joining today. And yes, all the green squares. Mm -hmm. Yes, Bakari. I get really happy about the green squares. I need to get more green squares. And I'm learning. I am learning. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what I'm doing for co-working tomorrow, but it's probably writing readmes on stuff. Nice. That's probably what I'm going to be doing. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And we will see you. I'll see everybody tomorrow, but we'll keep you posted when Laura is coming back on. Mm -hmm. Thank All you. Right. Thanks, Bye, everyone. everyone. Thanks, Jen.